If you've been part of the KYD community for any time at all, you know we're fans of the Super Duty. We moved from the F-150 to an F-250 back in 2017, and the difference in towing performance and comfort was striking. I don't feel like we're getting jerked around by the trailer. No, it feels very nice. With increased stability due to the suspension and even more power coming from our 6.7 liter diesel engine. 2,000 RPMs? Yes, sir. How fast are you going? 52. All right. Not to mention exhaust braking when traveling in the West. I became more confident in towing and do most of the driving now. We also found that we could cover more ground in a single day without getting tired, which is important to us as we tend to pop across the country from time to time. We have 14 hours and 35 minutes. Oh, don't even. We later upgraded to an F450 to tow our fifth wheel toy hauler, or boy hauler in our case. Quit. You know, these are the activities we should not be doing. But then we went back to an F-250 when we purchased our first Airstream. Although the F-450 had unlimited towing power, stability, and increased turning radius due to the wider front axle, it was a lot of truck when you weren't towing. By far our favorite truck so far has been our F-250 single rear wheel with the standard six foot, seven inch bed. Oh, wow. No, this is legit. Considering the miles we put on each year, combined with how well the Super Duty trucks hold their value, we ordered a 24 Super Duty Platinum in October of 2021. And only two years later, we received a call from the dealer that it was sitting on the lot, ready to be picked up. And we passed on it. We've got a lot to cover in this episode. Like, why did we decide to keep our 2019 Super Duty? A breakdown of all the repairs we've had. Is diesel really worth it? This research was surprising. And Mark's visit to Summit 4x4 in Prescott, Arizona, to replace our shocks, front end steering components, plus all our fluids after 126,000 miles. So let's get started. I love this truck. I have since the first day I've got it. It's been our favorite truck that we've had so far. But one thing I want to start off in this video is that this video is not trying to convince you to buy Super Duty, not even a heavy duty truck. In fact, our message from episode one has always been start small, start now. Whatever you're driving, if it can get you to the destinations, in our experience, it's always been about the places we've been able to visit, the people we've been able to meet, the memories that we're making. It's not about the equipment. Now, with that being said, the equipment is kind of fun to talk about. And um, people have been asking me why I passed on the 24. And in general, I wanted to provide more information about this truck in general. What are some of the maintenance issues I've had? Um, we're gonna pop up to Summit 4x4 to do all the fluids. And most importantly, I wanted to talk about gas versus diesel. And in fact, we wrote an entire article about it uh, that again, is not trying to convince anyone to go gas versus diesel. We just talked about the pros and cons in each category and so I'll link that down below that might be an interesting read I'm not going to talk much about it in this video because it's too long but all the information is right there okay so let's talk first real quick about why I passed on the the 24 Super Duty uh, and what's funny is we just did a meetup in Arizona and when we get together with people in person uh, oftentimes someone pull me aside and they say hey you know now that the camera's off and it's just you and me you can tell me why did you really pass on that Super Duty it's not a secret I'll share it with everybody the, the bottom line is there just wasn't enough inventory for the market to adjust the price. I ordered that Super Duty in October of 2021. And due to the pandemic and a lot of other reasons, the dealer didn't call me until I think January of 24 that the truck was ready. And at that point, there was no inventory of the Super Duties, the 24 Super Duties with the higher trim packages on the market. And so the price was absurd because there just there wasn't enough inventory to justify rebates incentives or anything to make the price normalized in my opinion the truck i'm sitting in right now is a 2019 f250 4x4 with the 67 diesel 355 gear ratio i bought this truck brand new in 2020 early 2020 this is a 2019 so it has the six-speed transmission msrp on this truck was eighty two thousand dollars I bought it for $72,000. I had to go to California. I had to flatbed tow it to the border and drive home. None of that bothered me. I drove home with a smile on my face because this was a gorgeous truck, still is, and I got it for the right price. 
when I look at a 24 Super Duty and somehow MSRP jumped up for the same truck to about $92,000. And then of course the one that I built had the high output engine because I wanted to do videos on that, a few other options. Somehow it climbed up to $105,000 before tax. I'm not saying that's too much for a truck. I just wasn't sure what I was gonna be able to sell that truck for. The point I'm trying to make is, we've always been, when it comes to RVs or trucks, it's not about how much something, what, what the price of something is, it's how much is it going to cost you. If this truck, $82,000, I buy it for 72, and right now as it sits with 128,000 miles, I can sell it for 50 grand, well that truck costs $20,000. You take in some of the maintenance and the registration and all the other things, that's how much the truck actually cost me to drive. Oftentimes, I think when it comes to trucks and RVs, people are focused on the price and they say, oh, that's too expensive. Well, it's subjective. What are you gonna sell it for? You know, and, and, and we get a lot of flack on the price of an Airstream. The, the Airstream has been the least expensive RV we've ever owned. What'd you buy it for? What'd you sell it for? What was the maintenance? That's your cost. The real reason I passed on the Super Duty is, is I feel like the, the automotive market is getting softer and softer. There wasn't any inventory within the Super Duties. And I just wanted to wait and see what was gonna happen and see what deals were going to remain. Now, during this process, I came across uh, this website. Uh, the website was called Car Edge. I knew that there was a, a direct relationship between inventory and the price of a car. But as a consumer, I, I wanted to know how many days has a car been on market? What's going on with, with the inventory and the supply of a particular car? So I came across Car Edge. It was like eight bucks a month and it, and it gave me the information I needed to know in order to make a good decision. Uh, let me tell you what's going on right now with Ram 2500s. There's something like 800 days of supply of that particular truck. So right now, if you look on Car Edge, you can get Rams for like eight to $16,000 below MSRP. Whereas with the Super Duty, there wasn't enough inventory for any of that to adjust. So if you're in the truck market and you're thinking you're gonna make a truck decision, that might be an interesting, they have a YouTube channel and they've got a website. And then of course they have the subscription where I can literally look at a car or a vehicle and I can see how many days that vehicle has been on the market. And then they give you kind of recommendations as to what they think is a, a good buy or if there even is a good buy on that car. So I thought that was, I, I definitely wanted to mention that. And I reached out to them after the fact and they said that they would provide a, a discount code to the KYD community. So thumbs up for that. Okay, let's get back to talking about this truck. I've made some notes on all the maintenance and uh, service that this truck has had since I got it. And I think you'd be interested in it. And, and I agree, I've been lucky. I mean, you, you hear the joke where it's like, it's all highway miles. For us, it really is all highway miles. We've got 128,000 miles on this truck. We bought it in February of 2020. So that's that's a lot of miles. And um, although they're highway miles, they're also mostly towing miles. At 5,000 miles, I did the first oil change because of course it came with the, the, the standard oil. And that's when I moved to synthetic. And I'm very, when I buy a new truck, I break it in very slowly. And right at 5,000 miles, I change the oil to synthetic. I'm not gonna get into how often I change the, the oil, but I will say that was the only time I changed the oil at 5,000 miles. The reason is an oil change on a diesel truck is substantially more. I think it has like 13 quarts of oil or so something crazy. It's $200 or more to change the oil on a diesel truck. And as a result, I moved to synthetic and uh, even send the oil into Blackstone Laboratories where you can take a little sample. So you know exactly how much water, how much metal, um, what, are the, what are the contaminants in the, in the oil, what's the viscosity, and then they can say, hey, it's either time or not time. And when you're talking about a 200 to $250 oil change uh, to send your oil in for $35 and change it at a much longer frequency, personally, I think that's the way to go. Okay, so I did that at 5,000. At 35,000 miles, we had the death wobble. And um, for those that aren't familiar, on the heavy duty trucks, they put us, instead of the independent suspension, like on a half ton truck, they put a solid front axle in the front. In order to keep that solid front axle centered and stable, you've got uh, three major uh, steering components. You've got your drag link, you've got your tie rods, and you've got your track bar. And, and the purpose of all these things is to keep the axle centered as you're steering left to right. The joints on the tie rod and the drag link and the track bar, when they get, it's like a, think of it like a ball joint. And if there's a little bit of play inside that joint, it can send the, the super duties. It used to happen with Ram, but I think they've corrected it. 
it can send the front end into like, you know, vigorously shaking. And, it, and it, when it happens, it's extremely scary because you don't know if you actually have control of the vehicle. Well, there it is. There it is. There it is. That's crazy. So the correction to that, of course, is to replace the front end steering components, uh, whichever is actually loose. And then a preventative measure is to add the dual stabilizer kit, which is the which is what you're going to see later in this video. It's you put the I changed to Bilstein, and it's a dual shock system that just holds all the front end steering components a little bit tighter. Personally, I love the way that a dual stabilizer kit drives on a truck. It makes the steering wheel free, almost like it has better power steering, while staying uh, really solid when you're driving. So like when you're going over like railroad tracks and you feel like the steering wheel will move, all that kind of gets mitigated and it feels more solid. So I love the way it steers. I would do that on any truck regardless of a death wobble or not. So anyway, we did that correction at 35,000. It's 72,000, by the way, I'm, I'm, elim I'm eliminating the oil changes because we already talked about that. At 72,000 miles, I changed tires. These are the Michelin AT2 tires phenomenal low road noise they tow great they track straight and i got seventy-two thousand miles out of them which is incredible at a hundred thousand miles i changed the brake pads i think we were in wisconsin at the time at 128 i've still got the rear brakes i think some of that is due to the fact that i have trailer brakes on the airstream and so that's assisting with the braking and it's prolonging these things at a hundred and seven thousand miles we changed the driver side battery uh, up in Nova Scotia, and I understand that that was a mistake. You really should change both the batteries at the same time, but the shop that I was at only had one, and so I changed that one, and I still need to change the other, but, and I will, but I haven't. Okay, and then 127,000 miles, I wanted to go ahead and uh, replace the dual stabilizer kit, which you're gonna see later in this video, to the Bilstein, because the one I put on the first time was the Icon kit, and in retrospect, it, it, it's a kit that really required a uh, leveling kit and or a lift. Every once in a while on an elongated speed bump, it would bump. And it bothered me when people would write in and say, hey, I got the Icon kit and does yours bump? And so I just wanted to get rid of it. Uh, I found out a buddy of mine, Scott, when we were putting the air horn on Randy's truck, I saw his Bilstein kit and it's specifically designed for no lift. All right, so this is the Bilstein? Yes. How much were they? Uh, 379. Okay, and they don't bump? They do not bump. And of course, when I was up at Summit, we found out that some of the other front end steering components were actually due to change, which by the way, no matter what brand of truck you have, at about 100,000, over 100,000 miles, these front end steering components like the drag link tie rod, they might be due to change on your truck also. This isn't just specifically a super duty issue. Maybe the death wobble is, but um, you might wanna check out your steering components too when you get into the higher mileage. Okay, that's about as long as I like to talk directly to a camera. So we need to pop up to Summit 4x4. The only other thing I will mention is uh, in terms of keeping the truck, I'm just excited to provide content as to what is it gonna take to keep a truck well-maintained from 125,000 miles going all the way to 200,000 miles. Plus, I wanted to do not modifications, I wanted to do some re-modifications. Like, what would I do differently? And for those that were telling me to get a truck cap, you were right. I love it, so don't worry. Truck cap stays, for sure. But uh, in terms of the bed slide and things like this, I know there's things I wanna improve upon in the future, um, and so we can chat about that. Summit 4x4, you might remember Jesse when we had the Jeep and we had the teardrop. He provided a lot of content on off-roading and stuff like that. The shop in Prescott, Summit, incredible. When it comes to suspension, and now, they're get, now they've gotten into all sorts of heavy-duty truck. There's all sorts of trucks there. So when it comes to suspension, modifications, stuff like that. Those guys, they're the real deal. So uh, let's pop up to Summit, let's meet Jesse, and start getting to work. One thing I always, anytime these rigs come in here, just like we did the first time, is I wanna go ahead and have the technician do a steering wheel shakedown okay. on it. Let's check the tie rod, the drag link, the track okay, good. Yeah. see well, if there's any, any good point. wear in there. 
Because um, it's been 90,000 miles since we changed. Did we change the drag link and the tie rod or just no, the tie rod? we did just the drag link end at the pitman arm. Gotcha. The last time it was in. Okay. We left the tie rod alone and the other end of the drag link alone. Okay. So, you know, 90,000 miles of on the road towing and stuff, it's normal. These parts all wear out eventually. So we want to make sure that, you know, that stabilizer isn't masking some other concern. Uh, that's a good point. That could be in there, something that's worn out. So we'll check it all over again before we put it And if I understand on. correctly, the purpose of the stabilizer is to prevent premature wear on the drag link. Yeah, and, and all that helps up front, absolutely. But what a lot of people, the assumption is, oh, I've got death wobble. All I need is a stabilizer for it, right? Yeah. There's other components that we need to make sure because all that'll do is put additional stress on the stabilizer. If you've got worn mm -hmm. out components, mm -hmm. it causes the stabilizer to wear out quicker and you're right back in that same gotcha. cycle again. Gotcha. So we'll, we'll check everything out before we put those parts on. If there's any other recommendations, we'll let you know. I talked to Mark already about looking at some preventative maintenance items. So we got to look at the, the differential fluids transfer case. We're going to get him a quote on the transmission pan gasket and filter on this. And then really, I'd like to just give it a once over for him. He does a lot of on the road driving, a lot of towing. So just make sure everything looks good for him. Okay. So. How many miles are in? 126,000. Okay. Have you had the transmission done before? I can't, I'm, I'm not going to answer that on camera. Well, now that I've got arm pump, what's, what's that? that? The drag link has play on both ends, um, and the track bar has play on both ends. Um, so I would probably replace both of those. Not uncommon to have those components go out. I mean, it's super, super common to have them go out. I mean, those parts are always working every single time this vehicle's going and turning and towing. So um, we'll get a quote on getting those replaced, and uh, I think at that point, installing that kit is just gonna be the cherry on top for you. So this right here is the dual stabilizer kit, right? That is correct, yep, by Superlift. And again, the, the neat thing about this is it's set up for stock configuration, um, which is fantastic. You don't have to worry about having a lifted vehicle on it. Well, that's the only reason I'm changing it. Yeah. Because every once in a while, the Icon kit, I will bump. Okay. But you know, with my truck, every Super Duty is just a little bit different. And yeah. I get all these emails by saying, hey, does yours bump? Because theirs bumps more than mine. Gotcha. So I wanted gotcha. to replace it with something that I knew was better. Plus, it's 90,000 miles now. Yeah. I feel like it's just not as good as it was. Okay. Do you think a dual okay. stabilizer would wear out over 90,000? Um, obviously, yeah, your shocks, depending, especially when you're putting them through the ringer, as you guys yep. are doing lots of driving, those things are only set up. We typically end up seeing shock life around that 50 to 60,000 okay. mile. Um, so if you've got 90 out of it, that's great. Okay. Um, and of course, I got 125 out of my OEM normal shocks. Yeah. Yeah, which which to me to be able to get over hundred thousand miles out of OEM shocks is is amazing. Okay, and I think you're really going to enjoy the upgrade from yeah. these built -in shocks. Hey, does it look like that icon kit is a little warped, like the bracket? Uh, and the... It is. Yeah. So when it's bumped, it's clearly bent that yeah. bracket a little bit. I think maybe it was contacting right here on your track bar potentially. I don't see anything on the track bar though actually. So it might have been on this cross member here. Yeah. yeah, right here and here is where it was hitting on this cross member. Wow, that's a lot of travel. Yeah. This one you just have a, it's in single shear. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have uh, support on the bottom of those bolts. And this one actually gives you this plate here mm. that puts them into double shear. Which oh, is really, nice. really nice for these bushings and stuff. It'll help support that, so. so these are oh, factory really? shocks. So if those shocks are worn out, that can cause feathering. Um, it's mainly on the inside, it feels like. Uh, there's some on the outside, too. Um, Rotating would definitely help that, but it also could be your alignment. And if we're going to do steering stuff, so we'll, we'll get it on the alignment rack and I can get okay. an idea of exactly why. Oh yeah. You're going to need diff service. <laughs> Plugged in? Yeah, it's hooked up. 
a lot of times what we'll see is what he's grabbing there is the breather that if that comes off mm -hmm. and you happen to go through any water crossings yeah. water will or just get inside there a so. lot of rain oh well we deal with a, we drive through a lot of rain that's possible a lot of rain i wonder if this because it is seeping almost just a little bit right here and that's probably from when they took these two bolts out for the original stabilizer. I wonder if that was able to introduce water into it. Of a ritual that uh, your first diff service, you have to taste the fluid. Oh, okay, is it? <laughs> How embarrassing is that color for video? That's not great. No, no. <laughs> what we could do is we could just show the portion of it where we're just bolting the cover on and we're getting the fresh fluid, if you'd like. Again, I think that just goes to show the importance of you know getting the vehicle routinely checked, and that's one thing for us here at Summit that we try to do is again be the one-stop shop, yep. right? So you're not bouncing between three, yep. four, five other shops. We know the history, we know the vehicle, mm -hmm. we know what you do with it, and we know how to make recommendations based around that. All right, so this is the differential which would be done at what interval typically between 30 and 50,000 okay. depending on the usage of the vehicle okay. and again we like to let the fluid talk that one's not talking that one's screaming okay saying, change me uh, but what this is my favorite part right here being able to pull this cover off and mm -hmm. then once he cleans all this out we can really get a good idea um, if there's any wear or any damage within there metal shavings at all in there no Okay. And a little bit, a little, a bit little bit's going to be yeah, normal just bad. because it is, you know, metal on metal contact. Yeah. What you don't want to see inside here when you feel in here is any chunks, which I don't feel. There's no chunks at all in there. Yeah. So that's okay. that's so, really good. So water basically got in here making it that color. That's what it looks like. Don't see anything wrong with this. It looks great in here. All right, so this is the differential. We're also gonna look at the transfer case. So what's the frequency Correct. of the transfer case? It's gonna be very similar between that 30 to 50,000 okay. mile mark. Uh, front differential transfer case and rear differential transmissions. Uh, if you flush those, usually again between 30 and 50,000, what we're gonna do today here is we're gonna drop the pan. We're gonna put a new filter in it. We're gonna check, make sure there's no material in there that shouldn't mm. be in there. Which, if you're not having any symptoms at all, it's it's more than likely gonna be fine. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's a safe bet being able to drop a pan, put a filter in it, instead of doing a flush on it. Okay. What's the? You thinking that might just be a little bit safer? Yeah. You know what? What happens is obviously there's there's wear and tear in these components, mm -hmm. right? So you get clutch material, you get bearing material. Um, and in kind of just a simple way to put it is that material kind of uh, helps hold things together, let's say, mm -hmm. especially at a higher mileage if it hasn't been maintained. So when you get in there and do a power flush on that, mm. it removes all of that. And then typically what you end up seeing is a transmission slip in, uh, shifting, gotcha. you know, erratic, that type of thing. So uh, just to kind of prevent that possibility from happening, dropping the pan and putting fresh fluid in there and a filter, um, we don't ever have any issues with gotcha. it at that point. Okay. This actually looks awesome. Really? Yeah. So you have a magnet in this pan that similar to that drain plug yeah. collects stuff. And you know, there's some stuff on there, but it's actually really not bad at all. Usually they have quite a bit more on them. So that Let me see. So the magnet is there to collect a lot of the metal shavings yes. and things to so give you an idea. Well, and so it doesn't keep circulating. Oh, okay. And so if it's really caked up with stuff, then you know you might have a problem. Yeah, it means you've got a lot of stuff loose in there. Um, and it gets to the point sometimes where it's just so caked, it's not even collecting stuff anymore yeah. and doing its job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like how that bracket is mounted. Yeah. It's got way more clearance for this cross member. Yep. I think this is a better design even if you had a lift. Yeah. I just like that I mean, the bracket goes the underneath only, the tie rod. The only piece of that is for people who are like off-roading a oh, lot. Oh, they that wouldn't want the lower clearance. Lower. Um, so yeah, that would be the only thing for, for certain people having the the clearance of that other one. Yeah, that's a good point. However, I Well, mean, it's not lower it's not lower than the differential though. No, it's not much lower. So it's not it's not significant by any means, yeah. but You want it at the bottom of this hole when it's on the ground, so I go a little above where it should be here.
Alright, so does the track bar put, hold it apart? So you needed a... Uh, the track bar centers the axle, but when you unload the suspension and have it at full droop, the axle shifts over. Mm. So the axle's trying to push that track bar Gotcha. It, it leaves it under tension. Gotcha. So you added your own tension so you can get that bolt down. Right, right. Um, and we'll have to wait until it's back on the ground to torque that end. Mm. Um, just because, well, for one, the bushing you want in a centered position. Gotcha. When you torque it, you don't want the bushing under some sort of load. Gotcha. Um, but also then it'll be easier to get that bolt back in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, baby. Try a little bit of spicy hammer. So yeah, you can you can also just tell like this one's much like when it's in the vehicle and we were shaking it down, you could see the play. Yeah. But even if you're just feeling this one, this this is pretty loose. Oh yeah. This one is really oh, tight. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, it's much tighter. Interesting. Which is what we want, and then as well as that bushing on that end was worn out and was moving around quite a bit. Where this new one's obviously a fresh bushing. So that big bolt's 406 foot pounds. Oh really? slightly, which is normal. Mm -hmm. Right there is 72 miles per hour. And there isn't as much road noise as there was when I was driving down to Prescott. And what's interesting about that is what the analogy that comes to mind is, you know, the, the old thing about how you boil a frog, you leave them in the, the water, hot water, and as it heats up, you won't jump out. I feel like that's similar when it comes to front end steering components and shocks. Over tens of thousands of miles, you just become accustomed to how the car performs and steers, and you, you kind of stop paying attention. And not until you bring it back to the correct proper suspension, ride, sound, the way it feels, do you realize that it was not correct? First impressions are that it is quieter, the ride is definitely improved, and the steering with the Bilstein dual stabilizers is actually easier to move the steer steering around than the Icon kit. But I still have all the stability, it's solid up front, which is great, and when you're towing, that level of additional stability adds confidence, makes you feel like your truck can handle things, so I really like it. Outside of the correction of the death wobble, I would add a dual stabilizer kit to any of my trucks from day one. I think they uh, it, it's a noticeable difference. I'm pretty satisfied. Great first impressions. The guys at Summit are an absolute class act. I would have I have no problem recommending their shop. In fact, I would even say you don't worry about driving there if you're if you're on a big trip and you're out here in the Southwest, plan on seeing them on your trip. That's how I treat really good shops. They are worth driving for. And uh, if you're in Phoenix, take a trip up to Prescott because when it comes to suspension and all the other mods, fuel tank mods, airbags, onboard air compressor, uh, suspension, shocks, lifts, one-stop shop, really good. Anyhow, so that's it. I couldn't be happier that I decided to keep the truck I love this truck, always have, and uh, I got 127,000 miles, and we'll see how many miles we put on it this year, and we'll just keep sharing with you mods and upgrades, and not even mods, remods, remodifications 
upgrades and uh, and you know knock on wood any repairs anyway all right that's it for now we're gonna go down and pick up the Airstream Trish and I have a shakedown trip uh, in Scottsdale and Tucson we're gonna make sure we have everything we need we're gonna pack up or hit the road and uh, we're headed we're headed east I guess this season is officially getting kicked off thanks for waiting talk to you soon Thank you.